Well, I'm delighted to be here. I graduated nine years ago, and my senior year, I was a Massachusetts campus compact leader, and so this really feels very full circle for me. Um, I'm going to be talking about communicating science to unscientific America, the topic of my first book, but it might be more aptly titled Communicating Science to a Nation Watching Reality Television, <laughs> because that's really what we're trying to do. And so throughout this discussion, this conversation, I want you to be thinking about who really influences much of the American public and where we can be more effective and how we can be more effective. Now, when Americans hear about science, it's not always the newest things that we're hearing about. We're hearing about things like Pluto losing its planetary status or something called Climate Gate that no one really understands but has something to do with conspiracy and hacked emails. I mean, this is not an accurate portrayal of science. And what do we get from the public? We get immense t-shirt and bumper sticker backlash. Science becomes the butt of jokes. It's what Jay Leno and David Letterman are talking about on late night television, but it's not taken seriously. And so I'd like to address kind of the state of science in the US and, well, what we can do about it, how to do a better job at communicating. Now, I used to be a congressional staffer in the Senate. I worked on science issues uh, after going to graduate school in marine biology. So I was very focused on the election in 2008. And I was interested in science issues, and I started following uh, the top news anchors. They conducted 171 interviews with candidates, asked close to 3,000 questions. Now, how many do you guys think talked about climate change or global warming? Any guesses? You probably know. You guys are quiet. OK, the answer is six. And compare that, I mean, is that bad? I don't know, but only three of them, or three of them mentioned unidentified flying objects. And you start to see that science isn't a priority. Now, a few facts. Less than 40% of Americans correctly answer the following question, the universe began with a huge explosion. There are different ways to interpret that, but 40%, less than 40% is a low number. 200 years after Darwin, 46% don't believe in evolution, think the Earth is less than 10,000 years old. I now work at UT Austin. I can promise you many of them live in Texas. Um, <laughs> just 18% of Americans know a scientist personally. Now, those who don't know a scientist are getting their impressions often from Hollywood. In Hollywood, scientists are often depicted as geeks, freaks, or villains. You have Dr. Evil out to destroy the planet, or you have Rick Moranis in any number of movies from Ghostbusters, uh, well, to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, to anything. There's an obsession with the paranormal. Factual accuracy is not taken seriously, nor is scientific plausibility. Yes, it's Hollywood. It is about entertainment. However, um, this is where most of Americans are getting their sense of who we are and what we do in the science community, and that can be very damaging to us. There, is, there are efforts uh, to combat this problem, problem most prominently. The National Academies founded the Science and Entertainment Exchange in 2009, which is an effort uh, based in LA to pair filmmakers with scientists to more accurately portray what we do in film and television. A good example of that is the Big Bang Theory, which if anyone in here watches it, they make a good effort at, at getting real science injected uh, into the film. Now, but I said before, you know, only 18% of people know, uh, know a scientist personally. Less than half of Americans can name a scientist. And can anyone guess who the top three names might be? Einstein. I heard Stephen Hawking. The answers are Einstein, Al Gore, and Bill Gates. <laughs> now, you'll notice of this group, they're either not alive or not the kind of scientist that we're talking about. So there's, the, there's a disconnect here. You know, why, if, if science is at the forefront of all of these exciting discoveries, if this is so paramount to moving toward better policy and a more scientifically literate society, then what's gone wrong? Well, foremost, or you know, there isn't really a foremost, but one of the problems is the, law, the death of science journalism. We're losing our science sections. Boston Globe, Washington Post, CNN, they're playing whack-a-mole with their science sections. We see them kind of appearing, disappearing, Science just doesn't have the same kind of priority. Part of this is socioeconomic, but the point is we're losing that information. The people who are the best and trained at telling these science stories are losing their jobs. Rick Wise is one example. He was formerly at the Washington Post. Now he's at the Center for American Progress, fortunately. But the people who know how to tell these stories are disappearing and disappearing quickly. But Within the science community, how do we tell our own stories? This is actually my own data. I didn't rip it off. I studied the majestic sea cucumber in grad school. And, uh, but but we, we publish in peer-reviewed journals. It's a very slow process. 
We are very meticulous. We're very careful with what we do, and it takes a long time to publish. That's fine. That needs to be maintained. However, uh, as Simon discussed this morning, it is a brave new world. New media is good, as he suggested, but you know, it's not really a single solution. In fact, it causes a lot of problems. In terms of blogging, anyone with access to an internet can blog. Everyone proposes that they're experts, right? And so the best science blog award in 2008 came down to a, a science blog that spends most of its time bashing religion, and another that's simply anti-science, where it's a climate change denial blog. The winner of that was the climate change denial blog, and that blog is often cited as an excellent resource for people who want science information. So we have this, the, the internet's contributing to misinformation. Uh, we have the rise of the anti-vaccination movement. Now we're seeing uh, diseases that should have all been, all but been eradicated popping back up because parents who are very educated, affluent, do not want to uh, vaccinate their children because they're worried about things that they see circulating on the internet that are based on fraudulent research. So we have extremism audience selection and we have these mobilized backpatting communities that really create an echo chamber much of the time. I'm not completely against blogging. I do blog at Discover Magazine, but I don't always like it. Why do we need an engaged public? I don't think I need to tell this audience and I don't have time to go through things here. Uh, but a couple of them, I mean, obviously, everyone's thinking about nuclear. I work in an engineering department now. I work in energy and teach in energy. Um, many people are concerned. Not many folks understand what's going on uh, with uh, those reactors. And there's a, a lot of people who are so-called experts coming out and speaking on behalf of the scientists who aren't really sure what they're talking about. Um, things like genetics, uh, genetics and neuroscience are going to be changing the way that we think about ourselves, concepts like free will, what even is, the, you know, what, what determines when life begins. Um, these questions are, are out there and if we're not prepared to talk about them, then someone else is going to for us, often a special interest group, someone with their own agenda, and science loses. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't end with how do we communicate science more effectively? Uh, kind of what the, the talk is about. So a few of my uh, take home messages that I often discuss when I'm addressing audiences. Um, first, don't be afraid to adapt to the new media environment. It's not the way that we traditionally are used to engaging with the public, but understanding things like Facebook and Twitter Maybe it sounds silly, but it actually reaches a lot of people. Many Americans get their news from these resources. YouTube is also a good example. CERN recently paired with uh, a rapper to talk about the Large Hadron Collider. They made a video and it was viewed by millions and millions and millions of people. It was a great educational tool because they weren't afraid to get involved. Know your audience. Uh, can't overemphasize this enough. As a staffer, I was often briefed by scientists. I could have five meetings a day with different scientists from NGOs and academia. Uh, nonprofits, special interest groups, and they would show me p-values. Now at least I had the scientific background to know what a significance value was, but many staffers don't. And so understanding kind of what your audience might be used to, accustomed to thinking about, really helps get your message across. Translate the scientific language. Don't try to explain everything. We get so excited about our research, we want to share our methodology with everyone. We don't always need to. In Congress I learned, even if you get five briefing packets this high on your desk, you need to know what is it, why does it matter, how does it affect me, my state. Boil it down as much as you need to, don't dumb it down though. Uh, state key IDs clearly. Choose cultural references carefully. I love this slide because uh, in the same week last year I gave a talk to the Department of Energy and to uh, an academic YouTube conference. Apparently they have such things. And uh, my role at the YouTube conference was to talk about how cultural icons could influence policy. And so I talked a bit about Bono and Bush, about Green Day and some of the stuff that they're doing with the NRDC. And I thought it would be interesting to take this same slide to the Department of Energy. And so I said, does anyone in the room know who the guy in the glasses is? And about two people in the back raised their hands. So the point is, just think about, again, your audience, what, what their norm is, what kinds of things they might be focused on. And pay attention, you know, focus on that. Um, and finally, the most important thing I can leave you with today is also very simple, but we always forget it, or we often forget it. Listen. We have a message. We, when we come to a briefing, when we educate young people, high school students, college students, whoever it might be, uh, we often talk and talk and talk, and we don't wait for questions. Follow up, give someone your business card, figure out what their concerns are, and then figure out how to address them, because it's really engaging, not just speaking to, that gets people involved. And so with that, and with my time still going, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much.